Welcome to this module of Foundations of Public Libraries. This session is Principles of Intellectual Freedom. My name is Mary Ann Morey, and I'm the District Consultant for Central District of the State Library of Iowa. These are the learning objectives which we will plan to accomplish in this session. We'll examine our personal beliefs and values when making library decisions, discuss three scenarios related to, to intellectual freedom, and review policies and processes for dealing with an intellectual freedom challenge. Before we can get to the details of the objectives for this course, we need to first ensure that we have a clear understanding of the term intellectual freedom. You will hear this phrase referred to often in public libraries as it is a key tenant in public librarianship, which is why it's included as a module in this foundations course. Libraries are in the business of providing information and sometimes that information gets challenged. But there's a phrase that describes why we continue to provide information that could be viewed as controversial. And that phrase is intellectual freedom. Intellectual freedom, as described by the American Library Association, more commonly known as ALA, is the right of every individual to both seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. It provides for free access to all expressions of ideas through which any and all sides of a question, cause, or movement may be explored. The underlining is mine. One thing that seems to be important for librarians to consider is this word, balance. If you had to summarize intellectual freedom in one word, it could be balance. You've got to balance your library collection with varying sides of an issue. You've got to balance your own belief system with the information from a system that you may oppose or may be opposed to what you believe is right. This means that you will have books about a variety of topics and those topics, some of which may be hot topics, will have varying points of view. This means you might have some materials on your library shelf that some people could find offensive that maybe even you find offensive. I want to take some time to talk a little bit about rights and freedoms which tie in with the legal aspects of intellectual freedom. The First Amendment to our Constitution, as listed in the Bill of Rights, addresses the topic of intellectual freedom. The First Amendment gives us the right of freedom of speech and of the press. This is an American freedom, and not every country enjoys this freedom. Oxford Languages defines freedom of speech as the right to express any opinions without censorship or restraint. This concept is what gives America a marketplace of ideas. In a library, this means that to uphold the First Amendment, we must allow for freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom from oppression of thoughts or ideas, and we must take seriously our role in the community as a place for people to come and read differing opinions from their own and find information without bias. The Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution allows for the right to privacy. You have rights to your own papers, to your own house, and the government has to issue a warrant to go into your house. This right to privacy has also been extended to what you read in a library. No one needs to know what you have read, what your own letters say, what the government has to, uh, or that the government also has to issue warrants to see those things in pursuit of a case. The American Library Association has created what's called the Library Bill of Rights. And while it's not really a legal document, it is still a very important document that espouses the, uh, the ethics of librarianship and intellectual freedom. It has been vetted by attorneys and is based upon the First and Fourth Amendments we just viewed. The Library Bill of Rights consists of six points, which we'll look at briefly in the next couple of slides. Here are the first three points of the Library Bill of Rights. I've highlighted the key provisions. Material should not be excluded because of origin um, or the background or views of those contributing to their creation. And your library should have materials and information presenting all points of view. As a librarian, you should challenge censorship. And points four through six go on to say that you should cooperate with persons and groups that are concerned with resisting 
um, the, the free expression and free access to information. Realize that a person's right to use a library should not be denied or abridged because of origin, age, background, or views. The Bill of Rights and intellectual freedom apply not only to your library's materials, but also to your exhibit spaces and meeting rooms. In addition to the Library Bill of Rights, the American Library Association also has two documents that are closely related, the Freedom to Read Statement, which you see on the slide here, and the Freedom to View Statement. The Freedom to View Statement came about in reference to movies when those became standard fare in library collections. Let's dive now into accomplishing our module objectives by examining and understanding ways personal beliefs and values may affect library decisions. There may be many things that sway our biases. It could be our background, our education, our experiences, and it may be as simple as our preferences. For instance, I prefer nonfiction over fiction. This word bias means disproportionate weight in favor of or against an idea or thing. And while the word can have a very negative meaning, it's also a very common thing we all have, basically like our favorites. So let's face it, when it comes to favorites, we're all biased in one way or another. We all have a favorite color, a favorite song, a type of music, a favorite hobby, a favorite author, a favorite subject we like to read about. And while this is expected, the problem arises when we let even those innocent biases influence our decisions for our libraries. Think for a moment about any personal biases you have that might be affecting consciously or unconsciously your library's collection. Do you purchase more of a particular genre because it's your personal favorite? Or do you avoid a, pers a particular genre because you don't like it? Do you avoid certain resources because they may bring in the wrong crowd to your library? Do you deliberately frown upon certain types of people coming into the library because of the way they look or dress or smell? Do you deny certain library privileges to people who are a certain age? Or maybe they're not a certain age? Whether purposely or unconsciously, we may all be guilty of allowing our personal biases to taint our views of library services. This is why it's important for us to examine our own views and think about how and when those views may conflict with good library service. We may get a chuckle out of this cartoon, but it also represents a bias that some library staff have toward books and consequently against movies or against patrons who only come to the library to use the computer. Sadly, our personal biases can affect our library's collection and our treatment of library users. Here are some questions for you to ponder as you think of how bias can creep into your collection. It may be not only by what is represented, but also by what is not represented. The link on this slide is to a school library journal article that you may find useful in doing a more thorough examination of your library's collection. When examining your library's collection and programming, think about who is represented and who isn't. Think of ways you can incorporate more diversity and inclusion at your library. According to ALA, censorship is, quote, the suppression of ideas and information that certain persons, individuals, groups, or government officials find objectionable or dangerous. It's no more complicated than someone saying, don't let anyone read this book or buy that magazine or view that film because I object to it. Intellectual freedom opposes censorship. Here's a little quote to remind you of our duty as public librarians. Now we'll look at some public library ethical and legal scenarios that sometimes arise in this area of intellectual freedom. Situation number one, a library refuses to purchase a wildly popular item because the director or the board or the collection development librarian, etc., thinks the item is not appropriate. Is this an act of censorship? 
Well, if this decision is based solely upon the whims or opinions of the individuals noted in the scenario, the library is most likely guilty of, scenario, uh, of censorship. But what does the library's collection development policy say? A few years ago, when this title was first published, at least one library did not order it because of the library's collection development policy, which said the library would not purchase erotica. One of the subject headings assigned to this book was erotica fiction. So the library was following its already established collection development policy not to purchase this genre. Your library's collection development policy may mention some things it doesn't purchase. Textbooks seems to be something that many public libraries don't purchase for their collections. Not having textbooks in your collection is not an example of censorship. And likewise, the library in this scenario wasn't necessarily guilty of censorship by not buying this particular book since the book fell within the realms of identified genre the library didn't purchase. However, because this book took off as a wildly popular adult fiction book title, and because many other books have similar subject headings now, the library in this situation would do well to review its collection development policy and possibly update it to include a now popular genre of adult fiction, which I think is what happened in that story. If the library in this situation has simply refused to buy this book because the director or the board president or whoever else didn't like the book or didn't approve of it, then the library was definitely guilty of censorship. Every public library should have a collection development policy that guides its selection process. This policy should be reviewed regularly and revised to accommodate new types of materials that may become available and or common in public libraries. Situation number two. This is another one that ties in with intellectual freedom. A parent asks to see what her 14-year-old daughter has checked out on her library card. Does this request violate intellectual freedom? In our legal course, you will learn more about this section of Iowa Code. As you can see on the slide, library records, records are protected by state law, section 22, or uh, section two of chapter 22 of the Iowa Code. You should keep what patrons have checked out private to the public and to the government because it's the law. Confidentiality or patron privacy also includes protecting patrons inquiries or their reference questions and their internet access details. There is a sample of a confidentiality policy and here is the section highlighted with the arrow that uh, deals with the fact that the library quote will not reveal the identities of individual users nor reveal the information sources or services they consult unless required by law. In our legal course, you'll learn more about this situation of privacy of minors library records. Realize now though that the law does apply to minors, but obviously there's a huge difference between a parent asking about a three-year-old child's library record and their 14-year-old child's records. Generally speaking, if the child is old enough to visit the library alone, the child is old enough to require your confidentiality. ALA has a privacy toolkit available, which includes a privacy audit that you can run at your library to determine the level of privacy you're maintaining. A simple online search should help you find this document. ALA is a bit notorious for changing their URL, so that's why I haven't shared it in this actual web uh, uh, slide here. Here's the third and final scenario. A trustee complains about a new book you've purchased for the children's collection because its views don't up, up, uphold the town's principle. The board thinks you should remove the book. While this may seem like an unusual situation, it occurs more often than you may think. And since the library board oversees the library, they do have a lot of power, but they also may not fully understand all there is to know about public librarianship, collection development, and the concept of intellectual freedom. You have the option to stand up to the outspoken trustee or quietly take the book out of circulation to appease your board. Or the best option is to take this opportunity to provide some trustee training. 
Assuming the book in question is one that has been added by following the best practices of your collection development policy, you can do the following steps to turn an otherwise negative situation into a good learning opportunity. Show the board your library's collection development policy. Show examples of professional reviews about the book in question and let the board know that the book came highly recommended from professional resources. Bring examples of other books that you already have in your collection that offer other views on the topic, perhaps views that the board does agree with. Explain that your community has a diversity of people in it and not everyone may think or feel or believe the same as your trustee. Explain that even if your community holds to one school of thought, there are other views being discussed in society on a larger level and members of your public have a right to learn more about those views. Offer to present or have your district consultant from the State Library present a session about intellectual freedom for your board. Now let's look at some sample policies and discuss processes for dealing with an intellectual freedom challenge or, as these are also known, a reconsideration. Your library should have a reconsideration form in place as well as a policy about the steps involved in reviewing a reconsideration request. This example is from an Iowa library. It is a standard form and you will note that it asks for specific information about the item in question. Most libraries will include the reconsideration form as part of its policies. Copy of this form should be readily available at the front desk in case staff need to offer one to a patron. A standard form usually has these kinds of questions on it. Why do you object to this item? To what specifically in the item do you object? What do you feel might be the result of exposure to this item? For what age group would you recommend this item? Did you read, view, or hear the entire material, and if not, which parts? Are you aware of the judgment of this material by profe professional critics? Have you seen or heard review of this item? If so, please name the source. And what would you like the library to do about this item? The form then asks for the complainant's signature and the date, and oftentimes a complainant just wants to be heard. The task of filling out a reconsideration form is often enough to end the complaint. Here's a screenshot of part of another Iowa library's reconsideration policy. You can see that the policy outlines the steps for a complaint or a challenge. The policy also stipulates the formation of a review committee and the general time frame of the process. Compare these examples with your library's policy and process. Don't wait until you have a problem. You want to be proactive in having a clearly defined process for handling any kinds of challenges or reconsiderations that may occur at your library. The American Library Association has an advocacy and intellectual freedom resource page on its website. The Iowa Library Association also has a page devoted to intellectual freedom. The State Library's website hosts a page devoted to intellectual freedom and confidentiality. And don't forget about these resources. Your district consultant can assist you with learning more about intellectual freedom and can offer to do a training session for your board about intellectual freedom. The State Law Library is also available to provide information and answer questions. And your city attorney may also be of help should you ever receive a reconsideration and need legal advice. This ends our session on intellectual freedom.